afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, thanks for joining this uh, roundtable discussion. And we're going to talk about a, uh, a reference architecture used to, you know, event enable legacy core banking systems here. And my name is Aiken, and I look after the techni technology partnership for Solus. And let me go around the table for my guests to introduce themselves. Uh, Jamel, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> so I'm Jamel, uh, distinguished engineer with Solus. Been with the company coming up to five years. Before that, I was primarily um, in investment banking. Distinguished engineers are a client facing role. We work with our kind of major customers and get involved with kind of new and innovative use cases. Thanks, Jamel. And Fran, you're next. Yes. Here for North Emia and Bumi. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, as well as uh, you guys. So a lot of background in this case, working mainly in banking and financial services last 20 plus years. And, you know, in, being involved in really large complex transformation problems as well. Thanks, Fran. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ori. Yes, I'm Ori, Ori Barra, and I'm uh, leading the Open Legacy Customer Success and Pre-Sales Organizations. Right, thanks, Ori. Right, so, Today, we'll be uh, discussing around this uh, reference architecture that I'm showing now. Hopefully, you can see it. And uh, to address a particular but common challenge that uh, banks are facing. And let's say, like, you've got your legacy, you know, typically mainframe systems on prime. And then, you know, containing critical, you know, let's say, Chris, uh, customer data that you want to share with your digital banking platforms or SaaS uh, offerings in cloud. And then orchestrate the business flows across those platforms. And the typical use case is the only channel payment solutions. And the first challenge banks are facing is how to unlock your legacy assets, right? Where, you know, building APIs around them has traditionally been very, you know, uh, extremely time and resource consuming task. And Ori, you know, based on your experience in the industry, how do you tackle that? Oh, thanks, Aiken. This is actually an excellent question. So. Uh... We experience many enterprises really struggling with the complexity of legacy environment, right? And that can be almost anything, right? So legacy can be mainframes of different flavors. It can be AS400. It can be all kind of Unisys, Microfocus, Oracle, all kind of crazy databases, MQ, COBOL, ERP system, you name it. Uh, and the problem is these solutions are complex. And that means that uh, customers and companies are not able to react fast enough. They're not able to be part of this new API economy. Uh, so so what they're actually looking for is, is a way to do it fast, to do it cloud native, uh, to do it microservices based. Uh, and and um, we actually took this kind of uh, ask and we try to break it down in what needs to be done to make this happen. So uh, we think automation is an important part, right? So normally when you talk about handmade or handcrafted and all this, you kind of relate it to quality. When we're talking about APIs and integration, this is definitely not the case. So what we want to do, we want to have API factories. We want to automate the process. We want to make sure the quality is right. We want to enforce organization. So again, customers are looking for API factory, not for one time off. Then we also look at the scalability, right? So a customer would like to scale. We've seen it uh, in the COVID period with many insurance companies, for example, right? That suddenly got hit but by so many requests that challenges dealing with it. So the ability to scale up and down is really, really important. And that's uh, very often something we connect together to the use of microservices. Uh, and then we also have some kind of uh, human resources skills, right? So uh, legacy experts are not around anymore, right? So these guys are normally uh, retiring after 60 or 70 years. It's difficult to get new ones. It's difficult to maintain the old systems. So customers are looking for a solution which does not require legacy expertise. And last but not least, customers are asking us to be non-intrusive right so they don't want us to touch or change anything from the core and legacy systems because it's not safe right who's going to fix it if something is broken so so out of these uh, principles we actually kind of establish the, the open legacy vision and we think that cornerstone right so how do we actually automate the process how do we support api factories how do we support breaking down this legacy and core complexity into something that can be used easily and doesn't require 
a hardcore legacy skills. Great. Very nice. Yeah, thanks, Ori. And right, so now we have the unlock the legacy data and then kick off the whole you know API adoption journey now. And Fran, could you share with us like what are the key considerations you know going through this journey for bridging between legacy systems and of course in the cloud uh, in the public and private cloud? Oh thank you. Thank you, Aiken. Uh, well, to, to be honest, right, I'm based on our experience in Boomi, uh, working in, uh, at least in our case, right, the, the, the Boomi MIA team in, in, with the large banking and financial service institutions here, we can see like a, from a two different prints, the two type of big challenges that we have, right? Obviously, one is people, right? Because remember, in this case, if we put the focus a little bit on the mainframe, it's not easy to identify people with proper skills on the mainframe nowadays, right? Also, if, if I'm coming back as well, the complexity to build, right? This legacy code in the mainframe directly is quite challenging as well. So I will say from a booming perspective, right? Using the, um, in this case, the low code, no code approach, right? I'm working with open legacy together, bring that specific approach where we can address that big challenge, right? So we don't need to have all the, you know, super clever cobalt guys involved. We can build those integrations super, super fast. And by the way, it's a new approach which is, is getting a lot of attraction here in Europe as well, right? It's, it's really interesting. Um, the second point as well is the time to market, right? So from a technology perspective, how, how we can reduce, right? So versus to invest three months, four months, six months, right? If we can reduce that time to market and maybe spend two, three weeks to starting to build and bring value into the table is a massive, is a massive win, right? Plus obviously this frictionless approach, right? So again, so you don't need to have, you know, a lot of people hand coding or building those different APIs. You can literally, right, in in just in a matter of minutes, building your, you know, APIs on top of the mainframe, which is absolutely wonderful, right? And the third approach, from a technology point of view as well. So what about, right, with the new approach around using Kafka, using in this case Solas, right? This even driving the architectures as well, right? So with Boomi. We can literally integrate with Solas, for instance, in two clicks, right? And have this seamless journey between, you know, Boomi's Open Legacy and Solas is absolutely wonderful, right? So bear in mind that, you know, with Boomi is create this, you know, work with a flat file or work with the mainframe is exactly an experience. So we can literally move data super fast as well, right? I know it's not a really simple task, but at the end, an iPass is probably one of the first solid steps that you can do towards that specific you need to be success, right, with a public cloud adoption. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Fran. And you mentioned about like event-driven architecture, and yes, you know, uh, people know like adopting EDA could be very daunting uh, when banking environments are so complex and often located in you know multiple regions across the globe, right? And yeah. Jamal, could you walk us through the importance of this uh, event mesh layer that see, you see on the diagram uh, in this in this architecture, please? Sure, I can. So, yeah, as, as you said, right, I mean, we've got lots of data flows happening, different systems talking to each other, perhaps coming in and out of your kind of iPads. So typically when you look at an, an architecture like this, you'll see lots of arrows, right? Arrows representing your data flows, system A calling system B and, and so on. The event mesh kind of turns that on its head to kind of completely decouple you from that traditional way of approaching data transfer. So instead of um, you know, system, you know, system A calling system B, you're just producing events onto the event mesh and consuming events from, from the event mesh. So your contract is quite simply on and off the event mesh, right? And the event mesh then takes care of all other requirements such as who else is, in, is interested in this data? Does it need to span on-prem to cloud, multiple clouds? So that, that general complexity is taken care of by the event mesh. And when you've got a use case like this, where there's an omni-channel nature to it, right? Um, the advantage really comes, comes to play because you may just have day one, one channel to begin with, right? Point of sale. So the system that you have that are handling kind of payment requests from that one channel, you don't want to have to continuously go back and revisit it as you add more channels, right? As you say, introduce mobile or QR codes, by having that decoupled nature, everything powered by the event mesh, all you're really doing is day one, I have a stream of events that represents one channel, day two, three, and four, other channels are coming online, but they're just 
events at the end of the day. I, I'm not building myself coupled to knowing what the other side is, right? And that's really what the event mesh is giving you um, from a kind of agility and kind of future proofing perspective. And when you've got multiple kind of regions in play as well, um, again, the advantages kind of bear fruit there because if you've got a certain piece of data that needs to be made available both in region and perhaps all the other regions, the, the source system is no longer responsible for duplicating that each time or having to be touched each time a new region comes on. It's just a case of, I've pushed it to the event mesh. The event mesh is now responsible for onward distribution to whatever region may come online. So it's, it sounds quite simple, but it's, it's simplifying that coupled nature of integration, right? It's just on and off the event mesh. That's, that's really what you were adding here. Yeah, yeah. And the event mesh is great, but when you have so many like uh, events or data, you know, flowing between those systems and cross regions, and it, it could become very messy, you know, very quickly, you know, because as you know, pop sub pattern is like uh, totally decoupling, you know, pop and sub by nature is actually very, you know, uh, uh, decoupling, right? And right, how, how yeah. do you apply like a governance uh, in this case? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And once you've got a model like this where all of your data transfers are as events, right? Understandable concerns arise, which is, you know, how do I know where the events are flowing? How do I perhaps access control certain events um, to a set number of systems? Or perhaps I have some geofencing requirements that says these events cannot leave this country or this region. So all of those requirements kind of do need to be handled, governance perspective. So what we can do is look at the successes that REST APIs have had with the API management space. So API management gives you the single kind of location to go see what's available, do versioning, access control, and so on. So Solace has actually kind of taken from that to bring to market the event management capability through event portal. So event portal becomes that single pane of glass onto your event mesh, right? So your event mesh may be spanning multiple clouds on-prem, all of that complexity. You want to apply some governance and access control rules, or even simple asks like, how do I do a search of all the events that are there in my enterprise, right? How do I know what's there? How do I collaborate across teams to kind of refine it or add new events? That's what event portal gives you. So um, we've kind of recognized that gap and, and those valid concerns in the market to um, create a product here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jamil. And let's talk about how this architecture will meet the, uh, you know, the modern day payment requirements, right? One of the biggest challenges is the, uh, in the payment industry is the regulations and the multiple jurisdictions. And, and Frank, could you help us to understand how do we take on this challenge with this architecture in particular? Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, coming back with the Jamil's comment, right, is, is super relevant here, the way that Solas works, right? Um, let me give you a quick example. So here is multiple challenges, right? And we have multiple regulations. We have global regulations. Uh, we have as well, uh, let's see, certain, for instance, Europe, European regulations, but we have as well local regulations as well. So the environment is really, really complex. When you have a payment, to give you an example, something that you want to Maybe you are uh, buying a, a new goods coming from Europe, but you have as well the supplier is in APJ, right? The payment internally could be really complex as well, right? So the, the, the movement of the data coming from the banking in US going through all the different elements across the regions, right? You need to take a lot of factors there, right? It's where, for instance, this combination of, you know, getting the data from, from the main thing, using Solas to distribute, right? Where we want to send those different payments, because sometimes you need to have like a multiple operations, multiple events for the, for the different, for um, the, you know, the, the same payment as well. And, and boom, internally, what we can do as well is starting to detect, right, different elements, right? That are quality aspects, for instance. So we can start to address those different challenges, right? We can distribute as well and provide, you know, cover those different rules for those different potentially, right, regulations. So maybe in EMEA, we are taking care of GDPR and we want to take 
care certain aspects. So we can work to enrich and enhance that specific aspect, right? And more important, right? We can start to create much better, clever, if you want to call it business processes. Typical ones will be KYC, right? Identity verification. It's super complex, that process, right? But to give you an example, we can start to leverage the scenarios where using combining Solas and Bumi together, we can start to identify fraud as well and take actions. Report to the regulator, right? Report to the bank, report to the maybe the three party company who needs to address that specific, I don't know, ask for the passport or ask for ID to the to the person who is sending the, the payment or vice versa, right? Those different elements, they are super important, right? And you need combining the uh, the, the IPAS in this case, let's see the open legacy side of it, right? We are talking about as well all the data quality aspects and, and also the event driving architecture. We can provide a really good end to end solution as well. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, thanks, friend. And then, you know, traditionally, like payments are initiated by, you know, legacy systems, core banking systems, as friend uh, mentioned and where the underlying technology is often legacy based, right? Then you have a big headache of uh, dealing with these old and new formats and standards. And, you know, like uh, as what Fran said, uh, are required by the regulators uh, in, some, in some cases. And those uh, different formats and standards across system boundaries. So Ori, could you share with us your experience in bridging this gap, you know, help in this scenario? Exactly. So this pain is actually our pleasure, right? Because uh, we, we know how to communicate and understand all kind of legacy protocols and systems and platforms and technologies. And, and what we do is actually getting metadata from the systems. We can parse, we can understand, and we create an agnostic representation of how do you actually talk to this specific system. And that's regardless whether it's a mainframe or core banking system or something else, we parse it, we understand it, we shape it in a language which is easy to understand to the rest of the world. And from there on, Boomi can just take it and actually use it like it was a very simple integration. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, as, you, as we all know, like banking uh, industry use lots of like, uh, you know, ESBs and SOA based type of technologies. So how does your approach differ from this uh, old kind of SOA based uh, layers, Ori? Exactly. So so that's also a very good question. And normally we're kind of, we, we don't like people blaming us for being a layer, right? Because we don't consider ourselves as such. What we're doing, we're actually uh, playing very important role in design time, uh, being able to understand and parse the information, the legacy formats and so on. And then we can expose them in a way that others can understand. That could be a microservice. It can be a tight integration we have into the Boomi atoms where Boomi is actually using open legacy natively as part of what they're doing, as part of the flows and the processes. Uh, and But when we get to runtime, there is no big heavy ESB acting as a single point of failure. It's lightweight, it can be moved to the cloud, it can run as hybrid and so on and so forth. It's about creating something which is generic enough and flexible enough not to lock a customer to a specific infrastructure. Yes, that's very good. Um, yeah, thank you, Ori. I, I think um, uh, one of the questions from the audience uh, before was asking about kind of API security. Yeah, so um, uh, or your friend or Jamal, do you want to kind of uh, help out on answering this question? I can yeah. take over if you want to. Um, I, I think it's a really good question. More when we are now we have more the focus on, on the public API, right? There's a few aspects that we need to consider. Obviously, is the security under the, let's see, on-premise or the system that potentially we want to access, right? The second one, obviously, we need to have a proper security layer in the middle. And the API gateways, they are super relevant as well, right? Yeah. Um, so, and that is the key element, right? You need to have a proper strategy where you need to define proper API policies. And you need to be sure that, for instance, you are tackling challenges around throttling, right? Or you are tackling challenges around security and enable as well those different three-party you know, partners or companies who need to have access to the API that they have as well, the proper, proper security, right? They trust the API as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, thanks, Brian. And um, I think this is great. So we got like, you know, just to summarize, right? We got open legacy here to unlock the legacy data and then sort of event mesh to stream the data 
uh, or events, you know, across different environments in real time, then Boomi will then be able to orchestrate the business flows across all those systems uh, involved. So, you know, it's perfect. All right, um, I think it's um, time up for us. Uh, thank you very much, guys, and the audience here, you know, for the interesting discussion. Feel free to get in touch with us if you want to know more about the solution or if you want to actually see a demo, you know, we are waiting to, um, uh, to do that as well. Thank you.